Good morning. Let's talk about something that has become super popular in data science, machine learning, and all sorts of coding adventures, Jupyter Notebooks and Google Collab. These are two fantastic environments that let you write code, see the outputs right away, and add notes and explanations for yourself or others, and basically craft these interactive experiences that can go far beyond traditional script files. You might have heard of both and thought they were basically the same thing. Or maybe you've never really used either and want to know which is best to start with. Whichever category you are in, today, I walk you through a friendly introduction to Jupyter Notebooks and Google Collab. Compare them and share some tips on when you might want to use each one. Let's start with Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are pretty much a staple in the Python ecosystem. Instead of writing all your Python comments in one big file called something like myscript.py, you break your code into smaller independent cells. Each cell can be run on its own without affecting or forcing you to rerun the rest of the code. This is a huge convenience because it means you can experiment with a snippet of code, see what it does, and if you like the results, you move on. If it's not working, you can tweak it without having to restart your entire program. This makes your coding process a lot more interactive and exploratory. Jupyter Notebooks also let you insert these special cells that hold text written in Markdown. Markdown is just a simple way of formatting text, so you can do things like headers, italic or bold text, bullet points, or even embed images or equations in LaTeX. This feature is super cool if you like to keep your code and your explanations together. It's especially useful when you want to share your findings with teammates or students, or maybe you just want a record of your own thought process with code you can run live. You can also create raw cells, which basically hold data or content that isn't meant to be run or rendered in any special way, like images or videos. Another term you'll hear a lot in the Jupyter world is the kernel. The kernel is basically the computational engine that runs your code. When you hit the run button on a cell, the kernel is what takes your code, executes it, and provides the results right there in your notebook. If the kernel crashes, you lose all your variables, so you will have to restart or re-import your libraries, which means running your code from start again, as with pure Python files. Likewise, if you want to start fresh, you can restart the kernel so that all the variables and states are wiped out, which can help you avoid these weird situations where your notebook's memory is in some unknown state. One of the things I love about Jupyter Notebooks is that you can have immediate feedback on whatever code you write, whether it's producing a table, a graph, or an error message. If you are trying to figure out which data transformation to apply, or what part of a dataset might have outliers, you can just try something else, run that cell, and see what happens without rerunning everything else. It's no wonder so many data scientists and researchers prefer Jupyter Notebooks for tasks like data cleaning, data visualization, machine learning experiments, and teaching. I preferred it over Python files as well while doing my masters. Because Jupyter Notebooks are so common, you'll find that you can install them in multiple ways. One of the simplest ways is to use pip, the Python package manager. So you just type pip install notebook in your terminal. Ideally, you do this inside an environment to keep your Python setup organized, else you could really complicate your life. There are two common ways to create an environment. First, using vnv, which is built into Python. You create a virtual environment by running python-m vnv and the name of the environment. Then activate it with the activate script. Once it's activate, install Jupyter inside the environment with the pip install notebook command. The second way is using Anaconda, which is really popular for data science. If you have Anaconda installed, you can create an environment with conda create dash dash the name of your environment. Activate it again using the activate script and install Jupyter with conda install Jupyter. Both methods keep your projects organized and prevent conflicts between different libraries. If you are just getting started, Anaconda is often recommended because it comes with many useful tools pre-installed and has a user-friendly interface. But VNV is a great lightweight alternative if you like to open your terminal. You can ask ChatGPT for all specific steps to set this up as well. Then, once it's installed, you can open a terminal or command prompt, type Jupyter Notebook, and it will pop up in your web browser. You'll see what looks like a file manager in the browser, letting you navigate to whatever folder you want and create a new notebook in that folder. It will open a new tab, and voila, you are ready to start coding. If you have multiple versions of Python installed, 
just be sure that your kernel is set to the right one you want to use. Now, once you have Jupyter running, the files you see or can modify are the ones on your computer. You can store your notebooks wherever you like on your local machine. The advantage of doing everything locally is that you are in total control and you can install any version of a library you want. You can also work offline, which might be useful if you are on a plane or in a location with unreliable internet connection. The downside is that you are limited by your computer's hardware. If you have an older laptop, it might be slow. That's where Google Collab comes in as a handy alternative. Google Collab is essentially Jupyter in the cloud, and you can use it for free. Instead of installing everything on your computer, you skip the Anaconda and boot up part to just go to your browser, head to the Collab website, and create a new notebook, or open one from someone else through a single click. Then, all your notebooks live in Google Drive, and Collab can link directly to them, which makes it quite convenient if you are already using Google Drive to store information. It provides all the same features as Jupyter, cells, code, markdown, text rendering, and even the same look and feel. The big difference is that your code is actually running on a virtual machine in Google's data centers. Instead of using your local CPU or GPU, you are using the remote system's hardware. In case you are curious about a straightforward demonstration of how to use Collab, you basically open your browser, go to the Collab website, and you'll see a big button that says something like New Notebook. Once you click that, you get a fresh notebook. You can type something like print hello world, in the cell, then press Shift and Enter to run it, and the output appears below the cell. You can add more cells, rename the notebook, and so on. If you want to get fancy and see if you have GPU access, you open the Runtime menu and change the Runtime type to GPU. Then, if you type something like NVIDIA SMI in a cell, it will show you the GPU information of the system you are using. And yes, you have access to a GPU for free, though it's limited compared to the paid users. Collab has a lot of advantages. For one, you don't have to worry about installing common used data science libraries like NumPy, Torch, or Pandas, because Collab already has a bunch of them installed by default. In many cases, you can just write your import statements and start coding. It makes prototyping and quick testing super fast, just like reducing barriers when you try to create better habits. And if you need a specific library that isn't installed, you can still install it right there in the notebooks by running a command like this one, pip install library name. It just needs an extra exclamation mark to make the cell run like a terminal. Another huge perk is that Collab offers free access to GPUs and even TPUs. That's a game changer if you want to train a deep learning model or do any computation that will normally surpass your personal computer. You can just select the GPU runtime, as we did, and harness that extra power at no cost. Of course, it's not unlimited. Google might time you out if your session is idle for too long, or if you exceed their usage limits. But for many learners and practitioners, it's more than enough to experiment with large datasets, train models, or try new techniques, especially for quick tests. Another advantage of Collab is how easy it is to share notebooks with other people. It's basically the same process as sharing a Google Doc. You can let people view, comment, or edit. Collab also saves your changes automatically. You can literally close your browser or have your computer crash and your notebook is saved in Drive. Of course, Collab has its limitations too. Because it's cloud-based, you need a decent internet connection. If your connection drops and you lose your session, you might lose some of your work unless you saved it carefully or your environment was pinned and there are usage limits for how long you can run a notebook or how much memory you can use. If you want more consistent performance or resources, there's a paid tier called Collab Pro, which unlocks more GPU time and other perks. Another thing to consider is that you can't just access local files on your computer unless you manually upload them or link them through some external service. The easiest route is mounting Google Drive in your notebook, which just takes a couple lines of Python. That way, you can read or write files as if they were in a local folder. Now, you might be wondering which environment is right for you. Jupyter or Collab? The honest answer is that it depends on what you are doing. If you like controlling everything and you want to make sure your environment is exactly how you want it, need offline usage, and have a decent computer and graphics card, Jupyter Notebooks might be the ideal solution. 
If you don't want to install anything, want to test something right now, need more computational power than your laptop can handle, or want easy collaboration with others, Collab might be a better choice. I typically use both depending on what I want to do. You can also develop locally, then upload to Collab if you suddenly need more resources or want to share with a friend. It's pretty flexible. As an example, let's say you are a data scientist exploring a new dataset. You might fire up a Jupyter Notebook locally, load the data, and start cleaning and visualizing. You'll create a couple of cells for reading the data, maybe some explanation in Markdown to keep track of your logic, and a few code cells for exploratory plot. Once you have a sense of the data, you might do some machine learning experiments. If they are not too big, you are good to go. You can run them on your local CPU. But if you want to try something with large neural network or an algorithm that benefits a lot from GPU acceleration, you might then say, all right, let's upload this notebook to Collab, turn on GPU mode, and see what kind of performance boost we can get. You can store your dataset on Google Drive and then link it. And once you've done that, you can run the same code in the cloud usually without many modifications. The difference is that you might see it run in a fraction of the time, or at least you are not tying up your own machine. Another scenario is teaching and sharing tutorials. When I've taught Python or data science, using Collab is amazing. Students just need a Google account, which they almost all already have. They click a link, copy a notebook, and they can follow along, execute and test stuff live while we do the course. No more messing around with instructions like all right, install Conda, open the command prompt, install this library, set up your environment with Conda, and fix tons of local environment bugs. On the other hand, if you are teaching in an environment where installing Python is acceptable, or your students already have it, and your task doesn't require much computing, or you have a powerful PC, using Jupyter is a classic approach. You give them a Jupyter notebook file, they open it in their local Jupyter, and they can code away. In either case, they get the magic of an interactive notebook, which is perfect for learning. Of course, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Collab can be annoying. Sometimes, your session will reset if it's idle for a while, or you might lose data that wasn't saved properly. You always have to be mindful of how much time you have on a GPU session if you are hitting any usage caps. At the end of the day, while notebooks are fantastic for exploration, testing ideas, and teaching, they aren't the only way to write Python. If you are building a full-fledged application, deploying machine learning models to production, automating tasks, or working on large software projects, traditional Python scripts or Python files are often the better choice. They integrate more easily into production pipelines, can be packed into applications, and offer better structure for complex projects. That said, notebooks always have a place, whether for prototyping, debugging, or quickly trying out new concepts before translating them into a more permanent code base. I hope you found this introduction to notebooks useful and that you now better understand why they exist. Thanks for watching and happy coding!